Welcome guys, assessment and resuscitation again, but this is more from the nursing point of view, but again an in-depth lecture. So emergency care is an episodic and crisis oriented, oriented care provided to the patient with serious or potential life-threatening injuries or illness. Now priorities and major goals of emergency management are to preserve life, to prevent deterioration, more definite treatment can be, can be given to restore the patient to useful living. Now, there should always be a systematic approach to the emergency assessment. The primary and secondary surveys provide the emergency nurse and the physician with a methodological approach to help identify and prioritize patient needs. Injuries to the face, neck and chest that impair respiration are the highest priorities. So the primary assessment includes A, B, C, D. A is for airway, B is for breathing, C for circulation, D for disability, that is also neurological status. Okay, so airway, the protection and maintenance of a clear passageway for gases, principally the oxygen and the carbon dioxide to pass between the lungs and the atmosphere. Breathing is inflation and deflation of the lungs via the airway. Circulation is providing an adequate blood supply to the tissues, especially the critical organs, so as to deliver oxygen to all cells and remove metabolic waste via the perfusion of blood throughout the body. So what is an AVPU scale? Okay, so it's a system by which a first aider, ambulance crew or healthcare professional can measure and record a patient's responsiveness, indicating their level of consciousness. So it's basically a neurological status scale. So A, V, P, U, A is alert, V is voice, P is pain and unresponsive. Alert, voice, pain and unresponsive. It gives you a gross assessment of the neurological status. Now basic life support or BLS, it consists of a number of life saving techniques focused on the ABCs of emergency care. Now we assess the patient's level of consciousness by asking loudly, are you okay? Instructing someone to call for help. If outside the hospital call for emergency services and if an atrial uh, defibrillator is available, it should be retrieved and prepared for use. Now if the patient has no suspected cervical spine trauma, open the airway using the head tilt and chin lift maneuver. So this is the head and the chin lift maneuver, held tilt and chin lift. And spinal cord stabilization is very important. Any patient coming to the emergency in a trauma situation should be assumed and taken for that has a spinal cord injury until unless it is ruled out. Soft cervical collars are very important to help stabilize the spine. Rigid collars in terms of major injuries. If the patient is suspected neck trauma, the airway should be open with the jaw thrust technique. Now, if the jaw thrust is ineffective at opening and maintaining the airway, a very careful head tilt or chin lift should be performed. So what's a jaw thrust technique? In this, the practitioner uses their thumbs to physically push the posterior aspects of mandible upwards. When the mandible is displaced forward, it pulls the tongue forward and prevents it from occluding the entrance to the trachea, helping to ensure a patient airway. Look, listen and feel for breathing for at least 5 seconds and no more than 10 seconds. If the patient is breathing normally, then the patient should be placed in the recovery position, monitored and transported. Do not continue the BLS sequence. If the patient is not breathing or is unresponsive or only gasping, once the airway is secured, give two rescue artificial breaths. Verify that the chest rises and falls. If the chest does not rise and fall, reposition the airway using the appropriate technique and try again. If ventilation is still unsuccessful and the patient is unconscious, it is possible that they have a foreign body in the airway. Removal of debris is very necessary from the mouth mouth-to-mouth -mouth technique if the patient is not breathing. A disposable bag valve mask resuscitation, resuscitator is required. 
adjuncts to the airway management. So there are a variety of artificial airways which can be used to keep a pathway between the lungs and mouth and nose. The most commonly used in long-term or critical care situation is endotracheal tube, which is a plastic tube which is inserted through the mouth and into the trachea, often with a cuff which is inflated to seal off the trachea and prevent any vomit being aspirated into the lungs. Now, in some cases, a laryngeal mask airway is a suitable alternative to an endotracheal tube and has the advantage of requiring a lower level of training than an ET tube. It is a supraglottic airway developed by a British anesthesiologist. In the case of a choking patient, laryngoscopy or even bronchoscopy may be performed in order to visualize and remove the blockage. An oropharyngeal airway or nasopharyngeal airway can be used to prevent the tongue from blocking the airway. When these airways are inserted properly, the rescuer does not need to manually open the airway with a head or a tilt, head tilt or a chin lift or jaw thrust maneuver. Aspiration of blood, vomit and other fluids can still occur with these two adjuncts. Circulation. Now, if the ventilations are successful, assess for the presence of a pulse at the carotid artery. If a pulse is detected, then the patient should continue to receive artificial ventilations at an appropriate rate. So this is very important to know. Okay, so average respiratory rate by age differs. Okay, so if you look at a child and you think the 30 breaths per minute is more than it is not, but if you look at an adult and the adult has 30 breaths per minute, then that's definitely a concerning issue. Okay, so average respiratory rate differs by age you should know these newborns is about 30 to 40 breaths per minute infants is the same as they grow older it decreases and by 6 to 12 years is 18 to 26 and in adults is about 8 to 12 to 20. now otherwise begin cardiopulmonary resuscitation at a ratio of 30 to 2 compressions to ventilations at 100 compressions per minute for five cycles so this is how you give chest compressions now, after five cycles of CPR, the basic life support protocol should be repeated from the beginning, assessing the patient's airway, checking for spontaneous breathing, and checking for a spontaneous pulse. Lay persons are commonly instructed not to perform reassessment, but this step is always performed by health professionals. Now, if an atrial defibrillator is available after five cycles of CPR, it should be attached, activated, and if indicated, defibrillation should be performed. If defibrillator is performed, five more cycles of CPR should be immediately repeated before reassessment. BLS protocols continue until the patient regains a pulse. The rescue is relieved by another rescuer or equivalent or higher training. The rescuer is too physically tired to continue CPR or the patient is pronounced dead by a medical doctor. At the end of five cycles of CPR, always reassess for a shockable rhythm and if indicated, prepare for defibrillation. Repeat the assessment before doing another five cycles. The CPR cycle is often abbreviated as 30 to 2 or 30 compressions to 2 ventilations or breaths. Now, infant CPR is different. Okay. Now, note the CPR for infants and children uses a 15 to 2 cycle when the two rescuers are performing a CPR, but still use a 30 to 2 if there is only one rescuer. Two person CPR for an infant also requires the two hands encircling the thumbs technique for the rescuer performing compression. So, let's have a look at it again. So, you see that the two thumbs have been used. Now the GCS or Glasgow Comma Scale is the most widely used scoring system in quantifying level of consciousness following a traumatic brain injury. It is used primarily because it is simple, has a relatively high degree of reliability and because it correlates well with outcome following severe brain injury. The neurological scale aims to give reliable, objective way of recording the conscious state of a person for initial as well as subsequent assessment. The scale comprom comprises three tests, eye, verbal, and motor response. The three values, separately as well as the sum, are considered. 
Now GCS is the scale used by nurses, first aid, ambulance services, doctors as being applicable to all acute medical and trauma patients in hospital as well as in monitoring chronic patients in intensive care. Eye opening, so the GCS is 1 to 4 in eye, uh, doesn't open eye, you give a GCS score 1, opens eye in response to painful stimuli, score of 2, opens eye in response to voice is 3, opens eye spontaneously is 4. Verbal makes no sounds or incomprehensible sounds, inappropriate words, confused or oriented. So 1 to 5 for the verbal component of the GCS, okay? So the verbal component based upon these parameters is 1 to 5. Okay, so motor is 1 to 6. Make no movements is 1, essential to painful stimuli, abnormal flexion to painful stimuli or decorticate response. Flexion withdrawn to painful stimuli, localizes painful stimuli, obeys commands. So, four for the eye, five for the verbal, six for the motor. Okay, interpretation. Individual elements as well as the sum of the score are important. 14 to 15 is normal or mild dysfunction. 11 to 13 is moderate to severe dysfunction. 10 or less is severe dysfunction. Now, if nothing proves to be imminently life-threatening, then you can proceed to a more detailed, focused secondary assessment. Secondary assessment should be brief, thorough, systematic assessment de designed to identify all injuries. The steps include EFGHI. So we've learned A, B, C, D, E, and now we're going to look at EFGHI. Exposure and environmental controls, full set of vital signs, give comfort measures, history and head-to-toe assessment, and inspect the posterior surfaces, EFGHI. G is also for glucose, okay? So give comfort measures and assess glucose, EFGHI. Exposure and environmental considerations include remove the clothes and keep the patient warm. Full set of vital signs should be done, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and pain. Assessing the pain, Onset, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, time, and duration. Pain is Caldera pain question. So, characteristics onset, location, duration, exacerbation, radiation, relief, associated signs and symptoms. Okay, so this is how you can assess any pain in any scenario in any history taking. Caldera, characteristics, onset, location, duration, exacerbation, radiation, relief, associated signs and symptoms. Okay, now the five interventions that are necessary in patients is oxygen, Diagnostics like x-rays, labs, ECG, appropriate monitoring, control the bleeding, and pain management. Give comfort measures and facilitate family presence. Empathize encouragement and support patient and family. Keep the patient and family informed about treatment and communicate care plan. Okay. History is very, very important. History, you can remember by sample, symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake, and events leading up to the illness or injury. Sample, symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical history, last oral intake. We have another mnemonic for our history taking called Palmer Foss. So take a look at our other video. Anatomical planes. So and here is the front. Posterior is the back, midline is a line drawn through the nose and the umbilicus, mid clavicle is the middle of the clavicle parallel to the midline, mid axillary in the middle of the axilla parallel to the midline. Directional terms for assessment, right and left, lateral and medial, superior and inferior, proximal, distal, dorsal, ventral, palmar and plantar. 
abdominal quadrants, right and lower upper quadrant, left lower quadrant and left upper quadrant. Focused assessment practices include background, skin, head and face, neck, neurologic, cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, urinary, reproductive and musculoskeletal. Background, you should take a biographical data, chief complaints, medications, past medical history, family history, and social history. Skin, look for itching or dryness, color temperature, ask about changes in bathing soaps or lotions, observe for rashes, lacerations, cuts, sores or lesions, and prior heel lesions, incisions. Head and face, often complain of headaches over tigo and syncope. Ask about change in vision, hearing, tinnitus, nasal snoring, and last dental exam. Facial inspection, a head and head shape, characteristics of facial features, palpate the head for evidence of skull fractures, look for open wounds or hematomas, look behind the ear for bruising, this is called the battle sign, and it indicates a fracture through the base of the skull. Look around the eyes for bruising, bruising that completely circles the eye, on one or both sides is called raccoon eyes and is a sign of skull fracture. Bruising that is only under the eyes is associated with a nasal fracture or a facial bone fracture. Note any cuts or wound on the face. So this is a facial inspection. Eye inspection assess to see if the eyes appear to protrude abnormally from the skull, which indicates a hematoma behind the eye. Assess the conjectivae or the whites of the eye for redness in thin lines. Irritable blood vessels of the eye could indicate a foreign body in the eye or bleeding under the conjunctiva or subconjunctival hemorrhage. Also assess the pupil to see if it reacts. Non-reactive pupils indicate a potential head injury. Eye assessment assess the eyes for movements in up, right, downward, left directions. And if the eyeball is not moving in any direction, then you must suspect either a facial fracture that has trapped one of the eye muscles, preventing it from working or bleeding behind the eyeball. Check the vision by holding fingers a few feet away from the patient and ask them to count fingers. Eye inspection assess for black material coming out of the eye. This indicates a globe rupture and should be treated with antibiotics like an open fracture. Look at the colored part of the eye called iris for a high femur. It's a blood layering in the front part of the eye. Look in the ears, assessing for blood in the canal. Clear fluid draining from the ear is a sign of skull fracture and spinal fluid leak or blood behind the tympanic membrane hemotympanum is a sign of skull fracture. Look for ecchymosis behind the ear battle sign as I have told. Check to see if the eardrum is intact or if you see cerumen or drainage from the ears mouth and buccal mucosa. Have the patient open the mouth to look inside. Note any loose teeth or missing teeth. If teeth are missing or broken, you should describe which tooth is broken. Note any intraoral lacerations, any wounds to the tongue or any hematoma under the tongue. Palpate the mandible and then have the patient bite down and see if the teeth align normally. If abnormal, can indicate a mandible fracture. Nose inspection. Assess the nose for patency of airway bleeding or leakage of clear fluid. Assess the septum for hematoma. Palpate the face for fractures. Okay, so. This is very commonly used in uh, pupil and eye response. Pearl, pupil, P is for pupil, E is for equal, R is for round, R is for react, A is for accommodation and light activity. So pearl, okay, P-E-A-R-R-L, pupil, equal, round and react, light reactivity, accommodation. Neck. Reassess the neck by noting the position of the trachea. So shifting of the trachea to one side indicates a problem with the lung on the opposite side of the chest. Palpate lymph nodes, thyroid, carotid pulse, and fine for enlarged nodules. 
It says for any air under the skin, it feels like crackling under the skin called crepitus. This indicates an injury to the esophagus, trachea or lung. If they are intoxicated and do not have a major other injury, then you can ask them to turn their neck from side to side and then touch the chin to the chest. If they can do both of these and have no tenderness, it is very unlikely that they have a neck fracture. Never move the patient's neck for them. If a fracture is present and you move the neck, you'll injure the spinal cord. Neuro neurological changes in the mental status, cognition, sleeping patterns, seizures, paresthesias. Exam mental status oriented to person, place and time in responsive to language stimulation. Cardiovascular, palpitation, chest pain in cold extremities. Exam heart sounds, pulses, edema, nail beds for cyanosis or clubbing. Respiratory, cough, shortness of breath and hemoptysis. Exam anterior posterior chest for respiratory effort. Symmetry of effort, lung sounds for wheezing, ronchi and strider. All lung fields should be clear. Gastrointestinal. Assess the GI area for obvious bruising or open wounds. Gently palpate the abdomen in all four quadrants. Finally, perform more deep palpation. Now, if the patient has tenderness, tightening of the abdominal muscles prevent you from irritating the injured organs. Correlate the tenderness with the anatomy. Genitourinary. Ask about nocturia, dysuria, urgency, or hesitancy. Observe the patient's hygiene, skin conditions, lesions, drainage, etc. Reproductive impotence or menstrual history. Examine for lesions, discharge, and orders. Examine the pelvis by pressing directly down on the pelvis, press in from the sides, and finally press down over the pubis. If the pelvis moves with compression, the patient has a pelvic fracture and needs to have the pelvis immobilized. Musculoskeletal, the exam starts with examining the extremities to note any obvious deformities. Then continue by palpating each extremity from the most proximal aspect, meaning near the torso to the most distal aspect. Look for point tenderness, which is focal tenderness at one spot, which can be a sign of a fracture. Look for open wounds or bruising. Feel for possible from the opposite side of the bruise. Finally, if the limb appears uninjured, then passively move all joints of the extremity. Limits of range of motion and change in gait. Also check for symmetry of right and left sides, muscle strength, signs of DVT and distal pulses. So this is how you inspect the posterior surface and log roll. Nursing analysis and differential nursing diagnosis is a possible explanation for the problem. Collaborative problems require team intervention. Planning, implementation and intervention. So be proactive and assertive within nursing scope. Intubation patients suddenly deteriorate. Look for displaced tube, obstruction of the tube, pneumothorax or equipment failure. What medications should you anticipate and prepare if the doctors are discussing intubation? What would you begin to prepare for if you received a patient with a pneumothorax or hemothorax? Chest tube. So you prepare the emergency intubation. So you need appropriate ET tubes, suction, laryngoscope, lubricant, stethoscope, stylet. Tape, NG tube. Customer service, five things that we can do to be more customer focused. Address the patient by name. Introduce yourself to the patient and family. Address the language barriers. Include the patient and family in the care. Communicate and update the patient and family. Evaluation and ongoing monitoring have to be done. Documentation of nursing assessment and care. Document, document, document everything. Why is documentation important? It's for effective communication, saves time, fewer errors, legal considerations, and professionalism. If you administer medication, name of medication, dosage, date and time, route of administration, reaction to medication, if any, and initial entry. 
addition documentation examples for discussion are chest tube output, elevated temperature, color of urine change from yellow to bright red, and no pedal pulse with femur fracture or decreased LOC. So let's have a review. Stabilize the cervic suspected cervical spine injuries, ABC, control hemorrhage and its consequences, prevent and treat shock, maintain and restore effective circulation, splint the suspected fractures and protect wounds with sterile dressings, monitor patient's vital signs, neurological state to guide in the decision making. Subjective data collection and objective data collection is necessary. Should consider special age groups, pediatrics and geriatrics. I hope you found our lecture useful. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel, share it amongst your friends and make sure you turn on the bell notifications. Thank you for watching.